first speaker of Act 2 and fifth speaker of the night. He is the chair of the Alberta Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Association, which seeks to ensure our outdoor heritage of hunting and fishing is preserved in its natural setting. Please welcome Neil Kion. Uh, so, thanks for having me. Um, it's pretty much the most terrifying thing I've done today, so... <laughs> yeah! <laughs> right, so like that, now let's just get into it. So, slide. Uh, I actually found it really funny. But <laughs> <laughs> so, like I was introduced, uh, I am a member of the uh, um, Alberta Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. I'd uh, like to give you a bit of background uh, about how I got it start started in hunting and fishing. Uh, it was actually relatively recent, it was in my mid-30s and uh, how it relates to the topic open season. So in the interest of saving time, I'll address three common stereotypes that come up with uh, when you think of hunters and anglers, and we all know that stereotypes actually do save time. <laughs> so stereotype one, beards. <laughs> so having a beard is not necessary to go hunting or fishing, but it helps look the part. People immediately assume that you know what you're doing whenever you pick up an ax, knife, or a toothpick. So, and also you look pretty badass when you're climbing a mountain. So stereotype is, two is trucks. So try diving, uh, driving down a pothole filled road in a car and you'll understand why trucks are, pretty, are worth their weight in gold and not because you can hang truck nuts off them. <laughs> and stereotype three is beer. I love beer, so I especially like uh, beer next to a fire. I can probably keep on going about beer and fire, but we should probably move on to the next slide. <laughs> So, um, I have a beard, I have a truck, and I love beard, so I actually meet the basic criteria if you're going into the wilderness. So I got into the outdoors because I wanted to get my children out of the house and doing something that didn't involve TV screens. So fishing seemed like a really good idea at the time, but as I found out, kids and fishing rods cannot coexist. <laughs> <laughs> so after having to entangle fishing lines approximately five million times, uh, explaining why it's not a good idea to swing a fishing rod around, and, <laughs> it's true stories, <laughs> and making sure that fishing hooks um, uh, don't go into places that they shouldn't, I can safely say that kids are terrible to fish with. <laughs> but, I persisted. So as you can see actually from my daughter, this is uh, her first uh, fish she caught by herself. I also knows I'm the one who's holding it. <laughs> so I persisted with the fishing experiment. Uh, I began taking my kids to fish stocking days in the local uh, pond so they can see and touch these cool little animals that uh, can be so difficult to catch. I've also introduced them to ice fishing, which is long gone. And, uh, <laughs> and they still haven't forgiven me for that. So if anyone can suggest how ice fishing can appear more exciting than staring at a hole in the ice, let me know afterwards. <laughs> Last fall, so I marked the first time that my son came hunting with me. Uh, so after a discussion about all the cool kids were blaze orange and finding a large enough stick, he was set. That day we saw wild horses jump on a puddle of uh, ice, and the day was actually sorry, considered a success. The animals in that area were probably the safest animals on the planet that day, but I would have actually had it any other way. So when I began uh, doing more with my family outdoors and solo, actually, it uh, sparked an interest to learn more about the wildlife that lives within it. So I'm sure that, like most of us on a drive through Canada, ask us, we have seen the goats and whatnot that are out uh, like in the road salt. It's these types of encounters with wildlife that reminds me of how lucky we as Canadians are uh, to have them in our backyards. And by lucky, I mean that we are fortunate to be surrounded by public lands and those wildlife resources within it that allow us to get away from the pressures and distractions of our modern lifestyle. I really do like technology, but I also love disconnecting from the world even more. So I define disconnecting as going into the wilderness areas where there is no cell service and spending time exploring these public lands without having to be worried about reading the next email or the next text message. There's something about finding your zen on the way up the mountain, although that might actually have something to do with the effects of the thin air. <laughs> the inhabitants of the public lands are carefully managed uh, wildlife resources. It's actually really amazing to me that the majority of these wild species were on the verge of being wiped out in the early 20th century. There's a couple different reasons, but as uh, shown by various pictures that I'm uh, displaying right now, they actually are alive and well. That is only really due to the concerted efforts of conservation-minded folks, including hunters, that wanted future generations to be able to enjoy these resources. When multiple species were on the brink of being wiped out, measures were taken to protect the remainder. So this is actually done by managing the specific times of any year that certain animals are permitted to be hunted or fished. The beginning of these periods is commonly referred to as open season. Weird. 
It was the introduction of these uh, seasons that actually allowed the wildlife populations to recover quite successfully. So as I got more and more into the rabbit hole of hunting, I really needed to understand how everything interacted uh, when people weren't around to observe them. So I did what any geek would do and actually began setting up cameras to see what's going on. So even though I have no interest in hunting certain species, it's fascinating to see what shows up. So one of the pictures previously was of a wolf that was actually was uh, busy stalking that particular area that I've been hunting. And other photos on that same camera, I've actually uh, spotted a moose cow along with a calf, multiple deer, and about a thousand photos of the same squirrel. I spared you. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to cameras, uh, I've actually spent a lot of time observing wildlife in our habitat, uh, which involves walking, waiting, not moving, and a lot of freezing your butt off. I use a stronger word. <laughs> but I actually get, I do get to spend a lot of time uh, observing and uh, looking at various of the landscapes and actually enjoying what uh, Alberta's got to offer. I, to put to rest the notion that hunters kill anything and everything in open season, I've actually passed up harvesting animals simply because I enjoyed watching them. And I didn't have a connection that uh, I would, or sorry, I did have a connection with those animals that I didn't really have a pressing need to end at that uh, various uh, times. The skills I've actually developed in developing wildlife has actually shown their value countless times. So summer as I was canoeing around Glenmore Reservoir with my wife, we managed to put within 15 feet of a um, in that case, it was actually a white deer, or a white-tailed deer, who carried on eating his lunch without even batting an eye as he watched. So being able to appreciate the wildlife and sharing that passion with others, in my mind, is actually pretty awesome. So being able to appreciate public lands and all their shapes and sizes has really impressed upon me the need to protect them. So not just because I like to hunt and fish in them, because obviously I'm pretty biased, but also to ensure that future generations can enjoy them as well. So much like what the previous generations have done for us, I figure it's the least I can do. I should mention that when I started hunting and fishing, it was primarily by myself. I talked to other folks and found that I had different ideas and ethics when it came to these pursuits, which is why I stumbled onto the backcountry hunters and anglers and actually ended up founding it. So what we like to do is uh, we actually call this uh, hunting the hard way. So what that does is uh, it entails actually working with regulatory bodies, industry, and other recreational groups that all hold the same ideals. And like I said earlier, this includes a lot of hard work, sweating, and a lot of swearing. That's it.